Well, hello everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. I'm trialing some new software, so uh, fingers crossed I can see the chats actually. So I think we're all good. Can I just get a thumbs up from anyone who can hear me? Hope you are <laughs> all receiving this loud and clear. I think there's a few of you on already. As always, we'll just give things a few minutes to uh, to get warmed up. Let's have a look. I'm going to test the chat out on my squeaky slidey draw. <laughs> Brilliant. So, can you all hear me? I'm just checking the chat's okay. Uh, it seems to be possibly frozen a little bit, but um, I can see Melon is on, Keith is on, uh, Mark. Hello Mark, Donna, thank you once again for joining Donna, Spencer, Grey Cat Blue from France, Icy Brittany, yeah, <laughs> isn't it just just coming out of this uh, dreadful spell of bad weather I think, so yeah, Lynn's on, hi Lynn, nice to see you, my good friend Lynn, down in Dorset, near the south coast in the UK, Mel, Mel's on, hi Mel, nice to see you. Nuala, Nuala, thanks for joining from uh, the west coast of Ireland. Wow, a place I'd love to visit one day, if you know or can recommend any good uh, guides. <laughs> Julie's on. Hello, Julie. Um, yes, when we'll be on to reseed your or seed your wildflower meadow this year. Love to see the results in the summer. Uh, yes, Julie, so I'm hoping to get there end of March, early April, uh, where I will be reseeding a meadow. I haven't posted... Well, I was posting on Instagram and Twitter about it, but I haven't done a YouTube post yet uh, about the meadow that I was um, creating, effectively, just outside Norfolk. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure uh, when, all fingers crossed, the weather stays dry. It's a bit underwater at the moment, actually, so, um, yeah, hopefully I'll be able to get there. Uh, end of March, of course, I'll, I'll keep you posted. 90% native, hello from Northern Virginia. Hello, nice to see you again. Thanks for joining uh, Mark Rowland's on. Hi, Mark. Donna, can hear me? Fantastic. Hearing you loud and clear. All good. Ah, oh, perfect. Ah, uh, Rajiv. Hi, nice to see you, Rajiv. He's uh, just joined on uh, YouTube, I believe. Uh, Ian. Ian's joining from Belfast. Hello. Another, another, uh, another person from Ireland. Fantastic. Spencer. Hello. Tricia. Oak Hill, Northern Virginia. Two people from Northern Virginia. What's happening in uh, Virginia today? <laughs> I believe that's possibly because 90% Native has been sharing the link on the Facebook group locally. So uh, thank you very much for spreading the word, of course. George, um, George, you've not missed anything. Thanks for joining us. George, in, George is in Hertfordshire uh, in the UK and uh, has just recently joined the channel. So nice to see you. Cackleberry Garden. Hello. Another one from Northern Virginia. Fantastic. Hey, look at that. Brilliant. No, fantastic. Great to see you all. Um, so uh, we'll just give things a few more minutes to uh, to warm up while we hopefully are all warm ourselves. And um, I suppose I'll give you a bit of a lowdown of the show today. Uh, oh, Clive's just joined. Hi, Clive. Nice to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Um, yes, so today's program got a very special, special guest uh, from India, and he's hopefully going to be joining us like I say hopefully come on let's have a bit of faith in the good old internet and uh, he's going to be joining us live and telling us a little bit about what he's been doing for the last 10 years I say a little bit it's quite a lot actually um, so really looking forward to getting him on the show and hopefully you guys can see some of the things he's been doing um, I've also got a few things to go through of course today starts a week of national um, bird box week so, or Nest Box Week, which is uh, fantastic. So, of course, we ought to be thinking about putting bird boxes up for uh, the spring for birds, which, of course, are starting inquiring into boxes and uh, nesting now. I've had some house sparrows this week just on the uh, looking into the starling box, actually, and poking their head into the uh, box that was used by the great tits last year. And so, we'll yeah, we'll be talking a bit about that. And um, yeah, just a general roundup, really. I've got a new feature for this week, which is uh, which was mentioned by uh, Keith. Keith is on the chat, 
and he had the great idea along with Mother Half a little while ago, so she's very pleased <laughs> that I'm going to be featuring this. Uh, and that is, I'm going to be talking about a, a single species of butterfly and how you can attract it to your garden. Um, obviously, I'm, I realise this won't be uh, a worldwide feature uh, to everyone, but um, of course, I will be featuring butterflies from around the world as well. So, uh, being a bit of a butterfly nutcase or enthusiast, should I say, uh, I'm going to be obviously, yeah, talking about a specific species. Uh, which is uh, and how you can help it in your own garden provide habitat food uh, and everything else which I think will be quite a nice feature and of course if you've got any suggestions for future videos um, or requests then then do let me know I'll try and keep it seasonal uh, because I realize of course I know it's February and as you can see outside in the uh, back garden uh, I'll put some millworms down by the way you might be able to just see um, just to see what we can attract the blackbirds been hopping around dunnocks robins wrens uh, the new six port feeder which you can see behind me has um, had a lot of attention uh, it's been full of goldfinches it's full of sunflower hearts at the moment uh, and for those of you that haven't seen it already check out my latest video on how to feed the birds in your garden and the three best foods you can be using at these very cold times to help birds in your garden of course um, yeah and that, that went down really well actually there's a lot of people been watching that and hopefully that will be giving you a few ideas of what you need to be feeding the birds at this time of year. But yeah, got a bit of a thaw here. The snow is just melting, dripping away. I'm pleased in a way. It's meant that I've not been able to do a lot this week. So uh, yeah, it's been a bit uh, uh, a bit frustrating in many senses. I started a job in North London a um, uh, week before this week. So, uh, uh, But I only got a couple of days in before, of course, the snow turned up and... Uh, ruin things or halted play for a bit so hopefully I'm, I'm planning on getting back there uh, tomorrow actually which will be nice to get back to work uh, but it's now at that kind of you know really annoying kind of slushy melting stage which just makes everything look ridiculously horrible uh, but hopefully we'll be out of there soon we'll be uh, back to dry ground again and uh, double figures I think even in the UK this week which will be nice and of course better for our um, bird species. I've just been absolutely flat out nearly this week trying to keep the bird bath defrosted. Um, birds, of course, need water this time of year, and I've had so many visitors. Many of you may have seen a little video I posted to Twitter, which I will post to uh, YouTube after this, of uh, some of the birds that have been visiting, which have been starlings, robins, house sparrows, wood pigeons, collared doves. Uh, blackbirds, all the usual suspects, um, blue tits, grey tits, all using the um, the bird bath to bathe and to drink, even in these freezing conditions they need to. Um, so if you can, do try and supply a nice fresh source of water. I know it's tricky, um, but um, yeah, do do that if you can, of course, and the bird feed, keep that going. And as I say, I won't go through it all now, but if you do have any questions, uh, drop me a line, obviously, on the usual channels, and uh, I'll be happy to help about what, how to feed your birds. But equally... As I say, the video is now up on YouTube um, and the three best foods you can be using. And I think that's pretty much worldwide. Um, obviously, it will vary a little bit where you are. But, uh, yeah, do have a look at that if you are not sure. Right, let's uh, let's have a catch-up on the chat. So, ah, Herefordshire Gardener, thank you. Nice to see you again. Ah, wet Herefordshire. Well, I should imagine it will be with all the uh, all the, the snow that's thawing. Alan Johnson, hi. Tuscan's come back. Nice to see you. Look forward to this. If you get time, what can you recommend for wildlife to grow up and over an arch? It needs to be evergreen. Well, Tuscan, uh, lots and lots of uh, climbing options, of course. Evergreen ivy is obviously a very, very good one. Uh, provides a great no uh, source of nectar for uh, a lot of uh, bees, butterflies and insects, wasps in particular as well, um, in the late summer months. And of course, ivy is a crucial larval food plant for the holly blue, blue butterfly um in the uk and uh, you know in europe as well uh so ivy is a good one um other than that native native evergreen climbers you kind of are a little bit limited but um, other good climbers one i really like is a hop um which of course we used to grow a lot in the uk but um now not so much and uh, they are the larval the traditional larval food plant should i say of the comma butterfly so many of you may think nettle is the normal food source which they have adapted to lay on now but um, hop is a really, really good one if you want to uh, grow over an arch. So 
yeah, it needs to be evergreen though. So I would probably go for ivy. Or there's a Trachylospermum jasminoides, bit of a mouthful, I think I pronounced that right, which is a star jasmine, which is a really nice evergreen climber, lovely scent as well, and good for butterflies and moths um, in the evening in particular for moths. Um, so that's a nice one. You could try that with star jasmine. Uh, you can, Fibians, happy Valentine's Day. I don't think we've said it, have we yet? Happy Valentine's Day. You may have done. Um, <laughs> thank you all for joining me. Uh, let, let's make this an official day. I was very pleased to receive this card from the other half, actually. Some of you may find this um, slightly relevant. Uh, <laughs> that is, of course, uh, a male cuckoo, which uh, Eurasian cuckoo, and um, quite a sentimental value to me this bird has because, um, yeah, uh, you may have seen the video uh, that I posted, a three-part series of the cuckoo that I was very fortunate to find and rescue last june and that's now on uh, the channel of course the three-part series so if you haven't seen that i uh, recommend um, a box of tissues with you as well uh, it was a little bit hard watching it back for me but a wonderful story of the release of these fantastic birds of course they uh, make the yearly migration to the central republic of congo in central africa and back every year so absolutely phenomenal they're red listed endangered species now of course in the uk uh, I know there's many species of cuckoo around the world and many of them which do travel some fair distances to uh, to carry out their life cycle. So, uh, yeah, but happy Valentine's Day to you all. And um, you might notice there's a bit of greenery, wrong finger, uh, behind me. And uh, that uh, I did buy for my other half. It was just, uh, I thought the house needed a few more houseplants in it. And, um, yeah, cracking specimen. I've completely forgotten the name of it now, so don't ask me. But <laughs> so thank you all for joining me on Valentine's Day and thank you all the halves as well, of course, if they're not watching uh, anybody out there who has Donna in particular was trying to uh, weave this slot into her busy schedule of the day before she was about to carry out some uh, uh, cutting some posts, I think, uh, as a romantic gesture for her other half. So, um, yes, hope you're all having a wonderful day, of course. Um, so let's just have a quick catch up on the chat. Um, Spencer, first time they came to my garden was yesterday. Oh, wow, nice one, Spencer. Yeah, no, hopefully you keep seeing an influx of birds. Obviously, with the cold weather, it brings a lot of them in. And highlight for me this week, and I have been filming it, I will bring it to you as a video uh, coming uh, in, in the coming week or so. Uh, the field fairs and red wings, of course, Scandinavian visitors, you may have seen one or two of the videos I've done on these birds previously, but I got some fantastic footage of them absolutely stripping my holly tree bare of berries. Hollies, of course, a great plant for the northern hemisphere. They're evergreen, they provide good cover for birds, nesting potential, uh, nectar source in the spring. Um, in the UK and Europe, they're the holly blues, uh, springtime choice for a larval food plant, and of course the berries nationwide. I actually, when I was in the States a few years back, I uh, witnessed a flock of cedar wax wings, which are very similar to the wax wings we get in the UK. Um, in uh, and I witnessed a flock in one of these holly bushes. Uh, fantastic birds, absolutely striking. If you don't know what they are, uh, look them up. They are incredible. And of course, I haven't seen any this year, but they usually come over again with the um, the field fair and the red wing from Scandinavia to uh, uh, to gorge themselves on rowan berries, crab apples, uh, rose hips. Um, you know, and the holly berries, of course, and other, many other berries. So, um, berries, 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 great for this time of year for feeding the birds naturally, of course, if you can. So, native shrubs to include holly, uh, rowan as a small tree if you're looking for a small tree for the garden, almost second to none for its um, uh, feast of berries that it can provide for uh, many birds, obviously, throughout these hard times. Um, let's have a look. Herefordshire Gardener, chestnut moss, and marvel du jour. I think you put Albert, I'm sure he means your mother is your, what an incredible moth. If you don't know what they, uh, sorry, I've, I've, I've pr completely pronounced it wrong. It's Marve du jour, uh, <laughs> which, uh, um, sorry for uh, anybody with a good uh, French knowledge there. That was a poor, uh, poor, poor show for me. But um, yeah, they, they love feeding an ivy apparently. I didn't know that, but um, nice to see. Uh, East Hertfordshire is full of hop yards. Nice, yeah. Well, of course they are. Um, a bit more in the south and east. Uh, Tracy, uh, I just started a hop last year, only a young plant. Yeah, they grow very quick, Tracy, <laughs> I can assure you. I planted one uh, two summers back now, or two springs back, and within a year they'll grow six foot, no problem at all, so watch out. <laughs> um, cool card, yeah, thanks, Donna. Sure, it certainly was. 
Uh, Beyond the Horizon, hello, thanks for joining. Debbie Austin, uh, thank you for joining us. When would be the best time to prune a holly? Uh, tricky one, really tricky one. Because of course, this time of year they're full of berries. Um, if you want them to have the spring flowers, of course, you won't want to cut them too early. And then, of course, if they are flowering and then going oh, live on the bird cam, you might be able to just see a blackbird there on the uh, the buddleia branch. Hopefully that'll come down and have a few mealworms. That looks like the female. Females, of course, are a little bit more brown than the males with the lovely uh, black bills. Uh, sorry, yellow bills. And the males are a bit more uh, darker in colour, of course. Um, yes, yeah, so prune a holly. I think if you're going to prune a holly, um, I would try and do it on a biannual basis so that you can let it flower one year. There you go. Look, I put some mealworms on the chair. <laughs> And uh, that female blackbird has just come come in to show off. And you might be able to see a couple of house sparrows behind it knocking about. And for those of you that are just joining, uh, this up here is my big buddleia, which is uh, very, very big. Uh, and in one of the videos that I'll be posting um, later on this evening about how you can attract birds to your garden and why you should garden for birds um, will show that buddleia in its true glory. Sorry, I digress slightly. Uh, so yeah, pruning the holly, I would say, Debbie, try and do it, um, you know, after all the berries have gone, let it grow back. You'll probably lose the spring flower, of course. Uh, but um, yeah, then at least, you know, just do it once. Try not to do it every year. Then at least you are providing food uh, moving forwards on a biannual basis. Um, Julie has said holly is definitely going in a shady spot when we start the garden. Absolutely. I mean, holly will grow anywhere. It'll grow in cracks on rocks. It'll grow in shade, sun. Um, clay, sandy soils, it is a fantastic plant, really, really good one. Uh, Dave Cooney, Cooney said, Hi, mate, what would you recommend are good projects for local communities to get involved in to promote wildlife, promote wildlife in towns and cities? Uh, it depends on the size that you've, of space you've, you're talking about, of course, Dave, but one thing is often, you know, window boxes or, or pots for pollinators. You know, if you can get your council to invest in some pots for pollinators, that sort of thing, obviously great if you've not got a big green area or any green areas at all. You've just got concrete streets. Um, you know, you will st still get bees and butterflies, obviously, coming in to, um, to use the nectar. So uh, I'd recommend that. And, of course, if you can, talk them into mowing less. That's a big, big thing that I'll be coming to onto in later issues. Um, so, yeah, do, do try and persuade them to uh, adjust their mowing regime before it kicks off. Obviously, this year, well, sometimes it's stupid. You see them mowing out in March before the grass is barely even growing. Um, yeah, so I hope that helps, David. But do get in touch if you, you've got any more questions on that one. Uh, 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 Spencer said, have you had any experience of the invasive marsh frog? Saw a horrible video of one gobbling up a newt and bumblebee. Uh, no, I haven't, Spencer. No, and I've not actually seen a marsh frog. I know there are some in the UK. Um I've seen frogs eating newts, though, even common frogs, they will eat newts, uh, smaller newts in particular, smooth newts, not a great crested newt, I don't think, although somebody I'm sure will correct me that if they've seen one. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen any um, marsh frogs, so I can't comment on that one. I should imagine uh, their diet will be similar to the common frog that we get in the UK, so I wouldn't put it past them, if I'm honest. Um, yeah, they will eat almost anything. I saw one kind of flailing its arms in the pond, wrestling a worm, <laughs> which was quite entertaining uh, last summer. So, yeah, they will eat most things. Um, David has said, over the past few years, field rush has spread across the lawn. Is there a way of stopping it without using chemicals? Uh, unfortunately, just, just digging it out, David, really, going down to the source and digging it out um, is the only way you're going to overcome that one. Uh, gardening and Aquatic Info. Hi, Joel. Sorry for late... No problem. I'm sure you can watch again. And remember, obviously, if you've got a dash at any point, hopefully you can stay with me for the hour. But uh, if you've got a dash, then, of course, this will all be uploaded to YouTube live um, later on, which is uh, the beauty of these lives. You can watch them back, of course. I appreciate not everyone can make the uh, the time zones around the world. So Ian has said, I have six hardy hibiscus I've been growing in pots. I'm planning to plant them as a garden hedge as the bees and butterflies of the giant flowers. Yeah, they do, Ian. Uh, hibiscus is a really good one for bees. Absolutely love it. A bit like hollyhocks, you know. Uh, the flower is similar and, um, yeah, absolutely loved by bees and other insects. Um, Mel said, I read if you trim holly too harshly, it dies. Um, possibly, Mel, although 
most of them are absolutely bomb proof you know you can cut them off at the ground and uh, they they will come back again uh, don't go trying that you know because i'm sure someone will come back and say that it's not worked but generally speaking most of the british native shrubs um you know they are extremely uh, good at growing back from uh, from a heavy coppice uh, which of course coppice management is um is one of the uh, videos that I've got on the channel. Well, I will be coming on to a bit more, but there's a couple of videos uh, about coppices and how good they are for birds in particular and other animals, of course. 90% uh, natives said, any recommendations to promote wildlife but prevent ticks? We have a lion problem here in Virginia. Um, well, I mean, ticks in the UK, they, they generally, you find them in dense vegetation, particularly bracken, obviously, in woodlands. Um, so I, if you if you want to avoid that, I would tend to keep the vegetation sparse uh, and obviously keep it away from path edges. So um, if you can, where obviously they will just kind of latch on to you as you as you're passing. Um, so if you can if you can keep it back a little bit from the edges of the vegetation, then that should help. Uh, but probably maybe planting a little bit sparsely as well. Um, so uh, there's not so much cover for them. I would say would be my my best bet on that one. Spencer says, "Do you think the variegated hollies are valuable?" Uh, yeah, I've seen many a many a thrush species uh, eating the berries from uh, variegated hollies. Of course, Spencer. So yeah, uh, obviously the native holly is is going to be the uh, the shrub of choice. But um, yeah, that's what I would do. Um, Beyond the horizon, it's love budly as butterfly magnets. They certainly are. Uh, yes, they uh, they are great. I've got um, you know seven or eight in the garden here, and they are absolutely awash with butterflies. Not as much as they used to be, unfortunately. I think with declines going worldwide, it seems. Um, and Lynn has said, nothing touches my golden king holly, but silver queen gets stripped very quickly like the common one. Yeah, probably just there might be a slight difference in the taste of the um, berries, of course, Lynn, which uh, are preferable to some birds. So that's what I would say on that one. Um, as Claire said, hi, I want an evergreen flowering climb with berries for wildlife. What do you suggest, please? Uh, well, again, probably ivy would be your best one, Claire. Uh, really good, and of course, providing a lot of nesting potential for birds as well. So, um, yeah, just a couple more, and then we're going to bring in uh, my very good friend from India. Uh, so Keith has said, holly blues are, in, are my main garden resident, but my dream would be to have a butterfly garden and plant to encourage as many species as possible. The Life Cycle of Butterflies book you re recommended will help. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll come on to planting for butterflies in another episode because as we move into uh, the spring of course and even now I was looking at my garlic mustard for the orange tip this morning and um, yeah nice to uh, nice to start thinking about things now that hopefully we're going to get a bit of warm weather. A bit more bird action as you can see just behind me got the blackbird and a few more sparrows uh, coming down for the mealworms that I've scattered on the ground. Um, gardening and aquatic info which flowers plants are best for attractive uh, butterfly and bees? Um, Depends where you are on that one. I will, um, yeah, I, I would say Budleys are obviously a good one, a really, really good all round one. Um, but of course, then you get a lot of herbaceous stuff, which will be very good as well. So, um, I'm going to bring in my guest now as a few more questions, uh, but uh, I'm going to come back to those shortly. So, yes, I would like to introduce you to my good friend Krishna, who has, I, I heard about his story through another friend of mine who will be coming on the show um, in, in a few weeks' time when things calm down a little bit. He's a bit busy with some work at the moment. But, um, yeah, so so I heard about Krishna's story uh, through him, and it's a really heartwarming one, I think, because it's my long-term ambition to, you know, buy, well, I, I wish I could buy, you know, half the agricultural land in the UK and rewild it and turn it into meadows and ponds and, trees and uh, woodlands but um, hey you know I haven't got a couple of billion pounds kicking about so um, but he's done a very similar thing in India and um, yeah well I won't I won't spoil it I shall let him explain so I'm going to bring Krishna in now with a little bit of luck Let's have a look at the sound. Krishna, can you hear me okay? I think you might be experiencing 
a slight audio. Hey Krishna, can you hear me? Bear with us folks. <laughs> the joys of using new software. Can you hear me okay Krishna? I can't quite hear your, um, I don't think your audio is coming through, your end. Sorry about this guys. Uh, I think, I'm trying to, there we go. Ah, Krishna, how's that? Ah, can you hear me now? <laughs> Can't quite hear you yet. Um, let me turn the volumes up a bit. Good old technology, eh? Yeah, I can't quite hear you, Christian. I've got the volumes are all at my end, so. I don't know whether it's maybe the settings on your end, possibly. Yeah, I can't, can't hear you, Krishna, I'm afraid. Are you able to adjust your settings, maybe, your end? I think he's muted. I'll tell you what, we'll give Krishna a minute. <laughs> I'll carry on with some questions. Sorry, folks. Um, it was working just before you guys came on, so <laughs> I promise you. Uh, he will be back with us in a minute. So let's go on to a couple more questions. Actually, we will. before we do, I will touch on National Bird Box Week. And here is one I made earlier, as a few people have said in the past. And um, this you might recognise as a robin box. Now, robins are obviously a, um, a bird that has, uh, yeah, uh, a very wide um, range, of course, they're across a lot of the northern hemisphere, and um, they like an open, an open front. I say that. I mean, I've seen them nest on top of bags. Oh, I think Krishna is trying to join again. I think he's having some connection issues. So, let's see if we can get him on. Krishna, I did until you pressed something just then. <laughs> your audio was fine but um, but then it muted itself or something's changed on your settings possibly no worries no worries it was fine I'm going to keep you live on here I'm just going to switch back to me for a second um, yeah sorry guys the joys of modern technology um, yeah just let me know Christian give me a shout when you are uh, you think you have sorted the audios? It's um, it's all fine and working my end, but uh, yes. So we'll just go back to the robin box for a second, guys. Um, so robins really like an open, an open-fronted box, as opposed to like a lot of the tit species, great tit, blue tit, of course. Um, if you're in the states as well, uh, a lot of the you know sort of um, uh, tufted tit mice, I believe, and um, Carolina chickadees, those sort of things, which are similar to our marsh tits, actually, gorgeous little bird. Uh, they'll like a lot of those will like um, whole um, whole boxes, but um, but yeah, an open fronted box for a robin if you can get one. And if you want to know how to make any of your own bird boxes, uh, then I would check out the BTO's website, the British Trust for Ornitho British Trust for Old Ornithology, <laughs> um, I because they have all the specs on how you can make all the different uh, size holes and all the different bird boxes that you could want to make uh, but in particular the ones I've got in my garden are starling, robin, blue tit, great tit, house sparrow, uh, jackdaw as well which hasn't been used yet apart from by the squirrel uh, but uh, yeah so national nest box week get some of these up because birds are starting to uh, prospect uh, their future homes now and uh, as I say I've had house sparrows in mine I've had um, you know ch checking at some of the uh, some of the boxes that I've put up already, but um, and actually, funnily enough, uh, last year this one was just wedged in a, um, a rose. I've got a multi-stemmed rose, uh, which I just wedged in it uh, because robins will nest really low down, 
and um, they are fantastic at uh, using the most ridiculous of places. I once saw one nest on top of a jumbo bag, you know, the big builder's one-ton sacks. That was in a garage in a job I was working on in Yorkshire. And uh, it just laid a nest, or had a nest, made a nest on top of this bag. So I actually had to <laughs> leave it there. Uh, Krishna, I think we've got some audio from you now. We did have. <laughs> nope, he's gone again. We'll keep trying. We'll keep trying. Bear with us. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I saw Robin nest on top of a tunny bag, which was quite a fantastic thing. So uh, if you can, make some bird boxes. Start putting them up now because birds will start in be starting to uh, will certainly sort their territories out. Um, Krishna, can you hear me okay? I think I can hear him, but he can't hear me. He's trying some different earphones, I think. So, yes, National Xbox Week. Yeah, can you hear me? Ah, perfect. Hang on, let me bring him in. Hi, Krishna, how are you doing? Hi. Ah, I'm fine. Sorry for the <laughs> audio. That's... No, it's fine. It always happens on the day, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Of his law. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Krishna, everyone. And um, yeah, I'm going to let uh, let Krishna explain a little bit about what he has done. And the piece of land that he purchased was about 15 years ago now, wasn't it, Krishna? Yeah, 15 years ago. 2006. Wow, yeah. And um, what was your, your uh, reasoning for buying this land then? Uh, let me explain why why I bought it. Uh, just a just a small uh, detail about it, so that you know people can understand uh, exactly why I bought it. So it is a small reserve forest uh, area uh, called Bisley uh, in the Western Ghats. So it's surrounded by another. Uh, on one side, there is a wildlife sanctuary. Uh, in Indian. Uh, uh, preservation of uh, forest, we have uh, national parks as the top end, then the wildlife sanctuaries as a second level of protection, and the reserve forest is the third level of protection. So this is a plot uh, inside a uh, reserve forest flanked by a wildlife sanctuary. So uh, there is a stretch of about 22 kilometers of road with no human activity, no human habitation, no commercial activity at all. So it's flanked by forests on both sides. So in 2005, one of my friends informed my partner in this particular venture, Ashok Vardhan, uh, about uh, a land which is about 15 acres. Uh, you know, that works out around, I mean, if you want in meters, square meters, I think it's around 61,000 square meters. I'm not, not going to challenge land. you on that one. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Uh, so uh, it was initially a cardamom plantation. He had abandoned about two to three years before selling it to us uh, because you know wildlife was uh, destroying his cardamom plantation and he, it was not profitable for him. And we were worried that since there was no human habitation in that whole stretch, there will be some commercial uh, tourism activity or some tourist resort will come, which will disturb the whole tranquility of the pristine nature. We used to go there as a trekkers, mountaineers. We used to go there. Uh, oh, you first used finished, to, you know, first finished when you uh, visited yeah. when you were a student, didn't you? Some maybe two or three years ago. Oh yes. <laughs> no, much before that. Much before that. About twelve years before I purchased, I had visited that lot as a student, as a medical student. Uh, we used to go there uh, more, more for a recreational trekking and exploring the forest. It used to be pristine, untouched land. And yeah, and, and, and I was obviously feeling... you've, you've got some, uh, so nearby there are some, uh, there's some visitation, isn't there, from every year from the, the public. And that's why you, you wanted to buy it, wasn't it? So that you could protect this area so that you know, there wasn't the encroachment of the public into this this precious forest uh, which now does have tigers in doesn't it they've moved back in uh, there there are tigers uh, in fact um two three years back uh, we had uh, tiger kill very close to our, our site uh, in the nearby village one of the cows was killed by a tiger and uh, wow so we know that there's a tiger in that area 
Yeah. Uh, we have seen the fog, fog marks of the tiger, but haven't visit. I mean, physically seen the tiger in that year. No, probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> good thing, yes. <laughs> So what I was going to do, Krishna, if it's okay with you now, is just um, show all the lovely people out there a, a little bit where where this land is because uh, a bit like me a couple of weeks ago, I had very naively not really heard about the Western Ghats. So um, I think it's probably worth me just showing everybody um, this little video, if you like, of whereabouts it is. So... Bear with me. Can you all see that? I'm just going to press play. I think that is all right. And I'll be back with you in a minute. I'm going to pause it there because um, I just wanted to uh, to to bring uh, bring Krishna back in because um, you can actually see on that there the uh, the cabin, can't you? Now, if, would you like to explain to everyone a little bit about that cabin as to uh, where it came from and, and why you got it there? Okay, for last 15 years we were uh, in a dilemma whether to do anything in that land or not. We, after purchase, we left it pristine, allowed the nature to do its own job of uh, looking after itself and uh, bring back whatever uh, cardamom crop had destroyed in that area. Uh, but, and you, were, um, you, live, you live about three hours away, don't you, from where the land is? Yeah, I live about three hours away, around 100 kilometers away from this place. So I visit there once in a while. My friend visits quite often. Uh, he's retired. He used to have a, a, a book uh, uh, bookshop, and now he's retired. Uh, so he can uh, see the place much more often than me being a doctor uh, having a medical practice in my place. So, uh, and it was a lot for for the students because part of the aim was to to monitor what was there, wasn't it? To to see what wildlife was moving back into the. Um, area and um, and I think you know obviously as you've said because this is in such a remote part um, of the the country uh, it's a lot of travel to get there and back in a day so uh, part of the reason for you doing it was for accommodation for the students to to monitor the wildlife wasn't it exactly uh, we used to have a lot of camps during uh, uh, our monsoon season which is the rainy season uh, in India which lasts for about three Three, three to four months, about 2,500 mm of rain falls in that one year. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that's from what, sort of June June to, to June to August? Yeah, June to, yeah August end, it'll uh, last. Sometime it goes up to, say, this year, it was up to November, it was stretching. But other, generally, it's up to August, August end. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, and, and so... So the piece of land itself is actually um, it's in the um, uh, the Western Ghats, which is uh, well, it's about fifteen hundred uh, kilometers, isn't it? Uh, fifteen hundred mile stretch of almost the whole yeah. length of the western side of India, which is an incredible amount of habitat. Exactly. Um, but I was fascinated to hear, um, or a little bit astonished, that is it's only three percent of India that is now protected, isn't it, for wildlife? Yeah. 3%. Uh, if you add all others, uh, secondary forests, it will come out to about 5.6% or something. Wow. In that range. Fantastic. <laughs> That's incredible, really, isn't it? You know, considering, and I mean, I know India is a vast country, but, um, you know, 3% isn't a lot of land. So, um, so your small <laughs> little parcel of land, it, it pays, it pays a tribute to the wildlife, I think, and, and hats off to you for doing it. Exactly. Um, so shall we? Shall I bring the the video back on again, and we can just run through a little bit of the some of the wildlife uh, that has started to move back in now that uh, Krishna has 
uh, you know, effectively rewilded the area. It's not done a lot of work to it. So um, let's have a look at that and see uh, just exactly what we can see. So this is inside the cabin, Krishna, yeah? Yeah, that is inside the cabin. And there's, there's the cabin. That's a path uh, going, and you can see the frog. Yes, yeah, and yeah. That's a whole I'm going to bring in yeah. now my um, my presentation that I put together of your wonderful pictures. Which is oh no, this is uh, yeah, this is what we wanted. Sorry. Some reason he'd gone off it. I thought, <laughs> I thought it was just playing, playing <laughs> over again. So uh, let me bring this up full screen for you all. So if I skip along to, so this is the cabin um, that Krishna has put in, and obviously it's a great little refuge for uh, anybody working there now. And um, if I skip forward a little bit, so so this is a baby frog, I believe. Yeah, that's a very small frog. Uh, uh, it's a variety of dancing frogs. So this is a young one of that. Wow, fantastic. And the dancing frogs, I've since learned through Krishna, that <laughs> they have this wonderful display with their legs where they lift one leg up uh, a reasonable way. <laughs> to uh, uh, Did we decide whether it was a d display to, other, uh, to, to females or a bit of a warning to males or a bit of both? Oh, we, we are not sure. The, no, one of the reasons why we started this cabin is basically that. Uh, uh, till now, what uh, during monsoon season, we'll go there. Uh, a lot of friends who get together, all the sci uh, scientific students uh, go there and uh, list the varieties of frog. But unfortunately, uh, we don't have a uh, few, few data. You know, why those dancing frogs, which are only endemic in that area, they are, they are not found anywhere. Um, yes, yeah. So uh, that, that's why we want to have a continuous study. And for that, um, those who are doing research has to stay in the site and uh, check them out day to day and find out. Yeah, fantastic. Well, let's have a look at some of these wonderful creatures. Um, so they're... Should now be coming on to some of the Wonderful photograph. So, this is whereabouts we are looking at in India. Oh, just come past it. I'll drop it back. So you can see. So the uh, the purple is the Western Ghats, isn't it, Krishna? Uh, this is a North uh, Western. Uh, this is called a North Western Ghats mountain rainforest. There are two parts: the Northern Western Ghats mountain forest, and the Southern Down Southern Tip has got a different type of uh, uh, mountain forest called uh, Southern. Uh, mountain forest. If you can see a small black uh, uh, pointer there, that's where my my land remains. Fantastic. So yeah, it is quite quite southerly, isn't it? In in terms of yeah, you know, quite in, that, in yeah. India. Wow. Okay. Well, let's yeah. let's uh, move on. You can see that we have about uh, five percent of geographical area which is under under forest, and yeah. uh, you know. Uh, we have about 16.7% of world's population and about 18% of livestock in the rest of the area. Wow. <laughs> Quite a few numbers because there's over a billion people in India now, isn't there? Yeah. Yes, over a billion. Wow. That's phenomenal. Okay, let's move on. So this shows you a bit more of the, the habitat and the terrain, doesn't it? Yeah. It covers the four, four states uh, of India. And... Yeah. Uh, what you're seeing here in this picture is uh, a, a, amount, a, small, a peak called uh, Pushpagiri. And uh, behind that, there is one, one more called Kumar Parvat. Uh, the whole area, uh, what you're seeing, is adjacent to my plot. It is on the other side of the road. Okay, yeah. Uh, 
that's a wildlife sanctuary it's much more protected than the area surrounding my my plot which is the reserve forest wow so this is the area called pushpagiri uh, wildlife sanctuary and uh, the the trees here are uh, basically the uh, evergreen mountain trees yeah uh, and uh, you know there is a, a evergreen tall trees and below that you have bamboo cane and other uh, middle range uh, trees wow i thought i'd stop on this one because this is when we come back to krishna is actual his background <laughs> at the moment <laughs> so um, what you can see is uh, the area which is uh, uh, slightly above my my plot uh, it is in a slight higher elevation so i could take a contrasting picture of what you just saw earlier that that peak which is now cloud uh, covered by cloud and uh, the area of the forest which is uh, next to my my land i mean even my land is exactly similar because it's contiguous as well as you know undisturbed wow yeah beautiful landscape yeah so i should imagine you get a lot of cloud cover what what sort of altitude is it where your land is uh, this is around around uh, about 1000 meters wow okay so yeah yeah fair way fair way from sea level yes and this is the the waterfall uh, this this opposite your land yeah that's the waterfall yeah that um, that creates a river called adole which later goes all the way towards the coast uh, nearly 100 kilometers uh, and reaches my town very close to my town and uh, then so it goes the all the way it goes all the way out to sea from all there yes, all the way amazing wow so you can almost take a canoe from your land back to your house <laughs> uh no it's a, uh the problem is there are a lot of hydro projects which are uh, have come uh trying to you know stop that and there are a lot of dams so it's a, it's a mess which is going on in the name of development yes wow this is a lovely <laughs> lovely picture this is and this is just up from your land isn't it a bit further along the road yeah uh, yeah that uh, small hillock what you see is called kannadi kallu uh, uh, a little translation will be like a mirror stone wow. so because uh, the, there's a stony area uh, which is uh, nearly about 600 meters uh, 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 which is uh, which reflects sunlight and gives sort of a mirror like uh, illusion wow. uh, from my my land i can uh, travel uh, you can see the right side slope on that slope you can uh gently uh, trek up up to the top of the peak wow that's incredible beautiful shot and then this and is this the road is so the approaching the road. yeah so the road is the road is just at the bottom of the picture there yes fantastic so uh this is also similar yeah similar habitat you can see from the trees yeah, Yes. So what sort of percentage of your land was cardamom when you um, when you first bought it or bought, uh, about, before you bought it? About, about half an acre you can think of. Okay. Wow. That's all. So where the container is there and adjacent to that there's a, there's a small patch of opened uh, I mean uh, not much of tall trees are there. Uh, so sort of a marshy land is there. So that that was the original cardamom plantation. Fantastic. Are this so this is the uh, the stream that runs through your land isn't it and these are some of the, yeah, the this students is a which yes these are the students who are uh, uh, doing a, a research on uh, frogs uh, during the monsoon uh, it is raining heavily and uh, whenever there is a short break they just uh, go around the stream and uh, try to find out the species and list them out fantastic well, it looks looks idyllic there they are look at the size of that yeah. tree i was Amazed at that tree and the, the the buttress roots that are coming off that when Krishna first showed me, just just incredible. So these are a few students who visited recently last year. Uh, there are some art students. They wanted to appreciate nature, so they 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 wanted to see our plot. So I just asked them to wow. drop by and take some pictures. Lucky students! I wish I'd have gone on something like that for a field trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a field trip. Wow. 
And this is um, some of the. This is one of the the fungi that you found, isn't it? Yes, that's fungi. Um, quite a large one. It's almost the uh, size of my fist. Wow! Looks like he's got teeth. <laughs> yeah, it's got teeth. Now here we go. This is some of the interesting stuff. So this is some of the wildlife that you've found, or the students have found. Um, so, and I don't expect you to name all, or um, or any of them. I suppose there's, there's, there's lots. How many? But no, how no, many? I, I, uh, this is. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you something about this. This particular frog. This is a, a called a Malabar frog or a bicolored frog. frog. Two colors. It's a bicolored frog. Yeah. It's uh, endemic uh, to Western Ghats itself, and uh, the tadpoles of this are pitch black, very yeah. slow moving on the streams. As you know, they make a clump of themselves, and uh, you can see the spot pattern on the back of this frog. Yes. It's, yeah distinctive enough so that you can make out the total population estimation. And there was a study done on this particular frog in our area, and they estimated uh, 0.1 frogs per square meter. Wow, that's quite a lot of frogs. <laughs> yeah, quite a lot of frogs during rainy season. So um, one of the feature is as you go closer to this particular frog, it uh, feigns death. Oh, wow. Well, we have uh, the, the grass grass snakes in the UK. For those of you that are yes, familiar exactly with grass snakes, and they, they they do the same thing. They open their mouth and they you know feign death, which is uh, yeah something that a few snakes do as well, I believe. True. Oh, fantastic! What a beautiful frog. He's a nice one. That's beautiful. Yeah, this yeah, is uh, yeah yeah. This is Bedon's uh, uh, Bedon's frog. Yeah, uh, one minute. Uh, yeah, this is a Bedon frog. Wow. Bedon's uh, Bedon was a British uh, military officer. Uh, he was a naturalist, so in the mid nineteenth century. So he became a first chief conservator forest after after leaving the medical uh, sorry uh, military field. So a lot of. Uh, uh, Frogs as well as uh, snakes, he has uh, really uh, found out, especially in the same area where my land is. So that's why this this particular frog was named after him. <laughs> Fantastic. Now this one is uh, I'm doing I'm I'm going to hazard a guess at this. He's doing his very best to imitate a leaf. By having that line down his back. Yeah, this one is called a Fejavaria uh, frog, and uh, uh, that line is called the Fejavaria line. So, right. uh, and as you can see, it's a great example there because you can see the leaf to the right, you know, and that that the midriff down the down the leaf is, uh, yeah, I should imagine these guys are hard to spot. <laughs> yeah, hard to spot, but they're uh, uh, they're called cricket frogs because uh, they keep. Uh, uh, the males especially keep uh, uh, making sound uh, to attract females. Oh, uh, right. So well. they are very noisy, noisy frogs. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> hard to spot, but easy to hear. <laughs> yeah, yes. Wow, this is a, this is what I would probably class as a typical tree frog. Yeah, this is a Malabar gliding frog or Malabar flying frog. So wow. Uh, you you can see the uh, uh, web space uh, between yeah. the two, uh, two. Yeah, so it uses that to glide, and it can glide uh, nearly about nine to twelve meters wow. across <laughs> one tree to another tree. So they leap down from they, they climb up and leap down from the treetop and uh, go and attach themselves to another another tree nearby. Fantastic. And uh, they uh, they create foam like uh, nests. Uh, and uh, lay eggs again on the tree. Um, they make sure that uh, you know they do that uh, above a stream or a small uh, pool of water. So when the the tadpoles come out, they fall directly into that water and they, they can survive. Amazing! Wow! What a beautiful frog. <laughs> this is one of the few uh, which nests uh, on the on the tree, and this is. Uh, the another species. This is that was the Lacophorus malabaricus. This is Lacophorus uh, lateralis. So this one has another great story. 
it was um, described by uh, Bollinger, who gave the specimen to Bedom, and there were only two specimens were detected somewhere in 1883. Wow. So till 2000. We didn't know that this particular frog existed because there was no um, nobody who found these frogs. Uh, then there was a group from Scotland who came uh, in 2000. This is from um, University of Aberdeen, and they found just adjacent to our uh, our forest in the, in a in a tea garden uh, a, a pair of them. Wow! So. <laughs> From 1883 to 2000, we didn't know they, they existed. And now we know that they exist. It's an endangered species. Uh, this again, like the, like the other one, uh, which we saw, the green one, um, builds a nest in the nest. And what you can see in beside you, beside the frog is, uh, is a nest. And this was captured by a friend of mine, Amor, uh, oh. who got both of them together, like the frog as well as the egg, a tadpole. Yeah, that's incredible. Sorry, I skipped forward there, but yeah, you can see, you can see those tadpoles quite clearly in those leaves. I've seen it a lot, you know, on David Attenborough documentaries and things, of course, where you know frogs in the forest will just lay lay eggs in the uh, in these small pools of water inside plants, which is quite incredible. And um, yeah, some of them, I believe, will climb great heights to find these little pools of water, won't they, up trees? Yes, exactly. There is one more uh, astonishing thing about this. This changes color. It changes color to wow. green. From brown to green, the same individual uh, changes color between brown and green. Fantastic. So probably that was the reason why we they, they didn't really find out that a distinct brown colored one existed. They must have mistaken it with the, the green colored uh, Malabar uh, uh, gliding frog. Wow. Yeah. Easily done, I suppose. Yes. So let's move on. So more students yeah. carrying out research. Yes. Now that's not a frog. Even I know that's not a frog. <laughs> <laughs> that's a scorpion, one of the heterometrous uh, species. Wow. It's uh, blackish green. Uh, sometimes it's uh, it comes out on the on the photograph as a green, probably because of the light reflection. A bit like the sort of iridescence we have it with. Those of you yeah. that are familiar with the butterflies of the UK will know about things like the Purple Emperor and, of course, you know, some of the South American butterflies, blue morphos and things like that, which, of course, seem to have this iridescent colour depending on which way you look at the, the wings, of course. Quite phenomenal. Wow, yeah. Another amazing insect. Now, this is, uh, this is up my street. <laughs> yeah, it's a rustic, rustic butterfly doing a mud puddling. Yeah, of course, a lot of butterflies around the world. Um, any of you who that have seen butterflies in big numbers on the ground where uh, there are puddles, of course, you will see them uh, with their proboscis out absorbing or imbibing the salts and minerals, a bit like these are, um, which will be, um, yeah, there you go, classic uh, photograph there. And you can see... This the is a painted sawtooth. Saw um, yeah, that's a painted sawtooth. Wow. Beautiful. And place. the earlier one, I think, uh, I think you missed one of them. Le uh, le uh, small leopard. I think you missed that. Oh, the orange. Uh, if I go back, this one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a small leopard. Wow. Yeah, similar to some of our fertilities, like the silver wash fertility in yes, the UK, of course. Yeah, similar to the fertility. Yeah. I think it comes in the same fertility group. Uh, yes. Yeah, I believe it does. And that's definitely not a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> this is a grasshopper, a blue-green grasshopper. That's all I could get. Uh, I don't know what the species name. Uh, no, I think you've done. I think you've done well to identify all those. Yes, amazing. Right. This is uh, Nephila pelipes, uh, female. Sorry for any of you spider spider haters out there. <laughs> Uh, this one is uh, found mainly in the primary as well as secondary forest. Females are large, males are very small. Females go, grow up to about say, uh, you know, the body length is itself around uh, five centimeters. Wow! And overall, they come up to about twenty centimeters. <laughs> and the males are five millimeters. Wow! Incredible. 
And I'm assuming probably after mating, the male becomes the uh, female's dinner. <laughs> um, may not be. The, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of uh, uh, different varieties uh, of technique uh, to choose the best male. Uh, uh, these uh, nephila, they mate with multiple males and keep the sperm with them. And they find out, uh, you know, which is the best male they can you know, choose, and they will choose that particular male, and then, then the the eggs get fertilized. Wow, amazing! And males have also found a way of avoiding this. They have uh, started plugging out uh, the female genitals so that you know they don't change their uh, to other males. So it's been very complex uh, studies uh, going on in this this particular species of. Uh, Golden giant golden orb spider. Wow, golden orb fever. <laughs> Amazing, that's an interesting fact for you for Valentine's Day. Eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Amazing. Wow, what a beautiful flower that is. What's that one? Do you know? Uh, this is uh, comes under Sonorilla uh, 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 genus, uh, it's a okay. purple flower. Yeah. Very attractive, I'm imagining, to, to a lot of butterflies and things with a longer proboscis to reach the nectar inside, no doubt. Correct. Yeah, this is quite something else. This is this reminds me, actually, for those of you that are familiar with the shrubs of the UK, um, of uh, Ceanothus, which is a, a bright blue flower. It's the only flower I can think of that is similar to that in terms of, obviously, it's growing... Uh, so the flowers come right out from the side of the woody shrub, uh, woody stem. I'm, I'm looking at this. Yes, yes. Uh, this was called ironwood. This this plant, Memicillon uh, umbilicatum, is the name. Uh, wow. it, the the leaves of this particular plant, what you see behind that, uh, produce a yellow colored dye, which is used by uh, Buddhist monks to dye their robes with the, that yellow color. Wow, amazing. <laughs> uh, and also the plant is very hard so uh, they used to use it to as a fuel to burn and make uh, produce uh, what they call as a wood wood steel it's a type of a steel which was imported from india um oh, right back, uh, uh, you know uh 5th century bc wow <laughs> been doing it a few years then uh, Yes, and that is supposed to be the uh, precursor of Damascus steel, what we know now. Oh, the wow. technique what they used uh, in that particular the thing, they were using some uh, black magnetite uh, uh, in ore in presence of uh, bamboo shoots and this particular wood. Wow. So a bit of history there for you as well. Yeah. Amazing. Wonderful. Well, I think that uh, that about concludes the um, fantastic, fantastic set of photos there, Krishna. I'm, I, you know, it's just Thank incredible. You. And um, and so a lot of these species, obviously, you're finding more and more. The more you um, research the area, the more the students visit. Um, and and so, what are your plans moving forward then for the future? How do you intend to manage the area, or is it just a case of to carry on? rewilding and let nature take its course no i'm planning to rewild uh, not uh, through human uh, uh, efforts but let the nature take take its own course the cabin only serves as a sort of a stay for people who are doing the research sure. one of the reason why why it's important because uh, if they want to research in the reserve forest or in the wildlife sanctuary nearby they have to take permission from the government which takes some amount of effort and uh, delay. Lots of so paperwork. Whereas, uh, yeah, lots of paperwork as usual. And uh, uh, being a private property, I can I can let them stay without uh, without all those uh, paperwork and red tape. So Fantastic. It should. Be. No, that's brilliant. I'm just going to check the chat quickly to see if anybody's got any um, questions for Krishna. Um, Oh, Rajeshri has said, 
Nephila spiders are not harmful to humans. Oh, well, that's good then. <laughs> yes, exactly. They are, they are, they are very friendly for spiders. Wow, and Mel said the uh, frogs are amazing. So much. How many species of frog have you recorded there now, Krishna? Uh, the last survey was about 32 species in our land. Wow, fantastic. That's we have around uh, 138 species which are endemic to that area itself, the whole forest. Wow. 138 out of the 158 species are recorded from India. So you can imagine how many are just... Uh, they are just endemic to that part of Western Ghats. Wow. And the, so that's that's pretty impressive to say that you've already got a fifth of India's species uh, of frogs already on the land, which, yeah, well, hats off to you. <laughs> that's, a, that's incredible. We have to find out exactly how many are there now. Yeah, well, keep looking. I'm sure there'll be a few more to find, yeah. <laughs> um, let's have a look. Yeah, Spencer said here a lot about Brazil's biodiversity in the media, but not about India's. It's very true, actually. Um, you know, you kind of tend to think of uh, the Amazon rainforest as the, you know, kind of go-to place for biodiversity. and um, But, you know, seeing some of those images there, I just, I don't know about everyone else watching, but I've just been blown away by the amount of wildlife that you are finding. And it's just, you would think that was in the Amazon, you know, with the, uh, the waterfalls and the types of trees and the... Um, butterflies and everything else just incredible really is i think we need to come to india and do a uh do a, a documentary on your wildlife krishna what do you say <laughs> definitely okay well let's let's start getting some sponsorship on that and let's get that let's get that done <laughs> yeah fantastic um yes yeah, so uh, tracy has said uh, i'm sure this is relevant to us um, are you encouraged by the number of young people taking interest in wildlife? We so need youngsters around the world to find this fascination and interest. So yeah, d d you know, I've yeah. I certainly find there's, there's a, I get a lot of a lot of um, you know students get in touch on YouTube in particular uh, from all the way around the world. There's one or two guys watching now, um, and I've got a friend in Kashmir as well. You know, who are really really keen to uh, encourage. Um, you know conservation and get into that kind of career so do you do you think there is a, a shift towards conservation with, within the students in india there is considerable shift i won't say uh, very significant because uh, uh, I've, I've, i know a lot of youngsters who are now doing research uh, i encourage more people to really join in yes yeah yeah yeah, I think it's key because, you know, even though you've got such huge areas of forest there, you know, that's not to say it's the same as saying, well, that's all right, the Amazon's huge, it doesn't need protecting, you know. <laughs> it's we, we all need to, to be careful because before you know it, things change and, and, you know, encroachment from cities and towns, you know, bit by bit work away at this habitat. And um, therefore, we need to spread the message and, and get... get um, Get people hooked from a young age. I think absolutely. No, so yeah, we also um, need, uh, no. You, go ahead, go ahead, Krishna. Sorry. We also need more people who can come up with you know ideas like us. Uh, there are enough lands available which which can be purchased and used as uh, uh, these sort of private uh, research stations. So unfortunately. Um, you know, there are very few of us who are who are doing this sort of thing. Rest of the people who buy these plots are more into commercial activity as a tourist sort, but not concentrating on you know, finding out what we have. Before we lose all we have, we need to find out what we have. Absolutely. And of course, raising that awareness and finding those species, like the endangered, you know, that, that frog you showed at the end, the brown one, um, it all helps build a case, doesn't it? Because you can say, well, look, this species we thought was extinct, you know, and now it's here. Um, so I think that's fantastic. So well, well done to you. And no, I, I can only say thank you very much. And it's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure, Krishna. And, and I'm sure everybody watching will, will say the same and, um, you know, give you a huge round of applause for, for your efforts and, and do do keep us up to, updated. And um, maybe sure, we can... 
maybe we can get you back on in uh, you know in a year's time or six months time to tell us what else you've found <laughs> definitely I'll, I'll, I'll be there yeah fantastic all right Christian well I'm, I'm gonna um, head back to the questions now but um, do stick around and obviously I'll uh, probably catch up with you afterwards but um, yeah so um, on behalf of, of everybody else I'd like to say a big thank you right. um, yeah thank you for, thank you everybody no, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Keep spreading the word, obviously. And um, yeah, anyone who wants to uh, to get in touch with Krishna, uh, what's the best way to, to reach you, Krishna, on, on social media or anything like that? Social media, I have a Facebook page. I have uh, Instagram. I have everywhere. You can just search for Dr. Krishna, D-R-K-R-I-S-H-I. Fantastic. I'm there. Brilliant. Maybe can, if I... Um, uh, once I'll switch back to to um, to myself in a moment, but then maybe if you want to go on the chat um, on YouTube while we're still live, and maybe just just drop your you know drop a, a link in um, in the chat if you like, so anyone that's interested in following what you do can do that. I'll do that. Perfect. Right. Okay, Christian. Well, thank you very much, and um, yeah, I will see you very soon. And uh, on behalf of everyone else, thank you so much again. Yeah, that my email is there. Oh, great. Yeah, I've got it. Fantastic. So, yes, thank you very much. And uh, keep spreading thank the word. You. And uh, obviously, I'll keep you guys out there posted as to how Krishna's doing as well. So, um, thanks, Krishna. I'll see thank you, you soon. Bye. Well, that was truly inspiring. I think you'll agree. Um, you know, to go out and selflessly buy um, a huge plot of land to, uh, to, to secure it for wildlife. I can't say that I know many people that have done that. And um, to then actively encourage research and the next generation to, uh, to follow um, in Christian's footsteps and, and pass on the uh, importance of uh, wildlife conservation, I think is an absolute brilliant uh, legacy to leave. So thank you so much to Christian. That was, that was incredible. Um, yeah so okay well if we go back guys uh, i'm conscious uh, i'm taking up a bit of your precious time uh we're over running slightly but i didn't want anyone to feel uh you know a little bit uh, hard done by because of the the sound uh levels earlier on so um yeah let me just take a brief look through the the questions and then i will come on to a couple of announcements um that i was going to make so uh let's go back to where i was um So, Keith had hollies. Yep. Um, Julie's found Adonis Blue at Sussex Wildlife Nature Reserve in Henfield a few years back. Had to be quick, but managed to take a picture. Yeah, I've, I've never actually seen Adonis, and, and Keith, on, who's watching, has uh, promised me <laughs> an excursion to Kent to see them. So, I'm looking forward to seeing them, hopefully, this year if I can get out. Um, UK Amphibians, nice to see you again. Hi, Joel. We use a lot of uh, a plant called Mind Your Own Business in our video. Yeah, I've seen it in your videos. Yeah, it's a great little plant. I uh, wonder if, uh, if you know anything else that's hardy, heat and frost tolerant and grows on the floor. Um, heat and frost tolerant grows on the floor. Difficult. I'll have to come back to you on that one, I think. A um, bit tricky uh, to find something that ticks all those boxes. But, yeah, I shall have a look into that for you. Um more yellow hammers, Herefordshire Gardener have arrived now. Fantastic. Nice to know. Look at you having yellow hammers. They're, of course, attracted by seed, ground uh, you know, ground food. They will come and uh, um, take food off the ground. Um, Mel said, Ivy is great for insects. Mine covers a wall and it's full of them. Uh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant, as I say. Um, Kieran Ward said, Hi, Joel. Is it okay to use tap water for wild ponds? Yeah, and of course, this is something I get asked a lot. If, you, if you're doing your own pond, and many people are out there, I'm seeing increasing numbers, so it's, it's brilliant. It's a good time of year to create one. But if you're using tap water, obviously, just give it a day or two, if you can, to let the um, chlorine uh, sort of disperse uh, and get back down to a kind of a neutral level, which, uh, which it will do. Uh, I mean, I obviously travel the country making wildlife ponds. I can't physically... Um, you know, rely on on uh, sources of water on the site that I'm working from. Not everybody's got a you know ten thousand liter water, but um, of natural rainwater. So I have to use tap water, unfortunately. But they do 
the the chlorine levels do uh, subside in within a couple of days or so, and uh, yeah, should should go to normal. So that's that's fine on that one, Kieran. Um, George has said, "Are lilac trees good for nectar?" Uh, loving insects, I have a large tree in the garden. Lilac, yeah, absolutely, yeah, very good for um, you know for for a lot of insects. Uh, I even saw an, my first orange tip uh, last year nectaring on a lilac, um, which is the first record I've had of them. So yeah, lilac, lilacs are a good one for that. Um, Spencer said quite funny last spring. Council was bending over backwards to cut verges getting stuck in wet ground, having to be pulled out. And that, uh, yeah, yeah, going back to flailing, yeah, it's a toy for another day. <laughs> Councils and mowing regimes. Um, gardening and crafting info. Yeah, oh, glad you've seen the sparrows. Um, yeah, they're knocking about. They're still still going, still feeding. They're, uh, yeah, they'll soon be going to roost, but uh, a bit of light left. Um, Hope should go on and send it back. No worries. Um, Joe Pieweed. Uh, Shane Kerr said... Joe Pieweed, Eupatorium is fantastic for butterflies if you have the space. Yep, I would agree with that, Shane, completely. Um, let's have a look. So Mel said a good one. If access is a problem, so we're talking again, as I said before, National Nest Box Week, so start getting your bird boxes built. I will be doing a video shortly, actually, on how to build a few of the more common bird boxes. So uh, hopefully that will give you guys a bit of help and advice on that one. But as I said before, uh, BTO, British Trust for Ornithology, go on their website and check out the boxes. Uh, they've got all the specs, all the dimensions and everything. Uh, generally speaking, you can just use six-inch gravel board that you can buy in builders' merchants for fencing, which is as good as anything I find for uh, for making bird boxes. Um would you st site, still cite the boxes high up? Um, if we get some put up, we may not be able to clear them at the end of the season. Yeah, so height. I mean, the height, generally speaking, for boxes, I would go for, you know, if it's tip boxes on a tree, for example, I would go six to eight feet as a minimum. Um, if it's robins, they will nest almost at ground level. And the great tip box, so this robin box that I was telling you about earlier, the great is nested in that, in the big rose bush, which you can just see, Actually, I will get the hang of this finger pointing at some point. Uh, that is my giant dog rose, which is behind the buddleia. And this robin box was wedged in the middle of that, about four foot off the ground. Sadly, I think a squirrel came in and decimated the chicks because I found a load of um, nest material uh, sort of sprawling out of the box. Uh, yeah, last su summer. So uh, it was a bit of a sad sight, that. And, um, yeah, so I will be putting it higher up next year and in a better spot. I didn't think the squirrel would be able to get in because of all the thorns and the rose, but obviously it did. So that was a shame to see. But um, but yeah, so um, but yeah, generally speaking, bird boxes six to eight feet if you can. Then obviously make sure you can have a, a hinge lid so you can clean them out. This time uh, of year, of course, is a good time to be checking your nest boxes, uh, pulling all the old material out. Um, they will like to. A lot of birds will like to make their own nest from scratch. So pull the old material out. Be careful of fleas. Uh, yes, they are likely to overwinter in boxes and old nest material where it's warm. Uh, so do be careful. Put some goggles and things on if you can, gloves and that, because they do. I've had them jump over me before and it's not pleasant. Um, but, um, yeah, and then obviously if you want to clean them out, just use some boiling water uh, in the box to get rid of any uh, of the fleas or anything, uh, just to clean them out, just to sterilise them a bit before the new birds start nesting, of course. Um, so that's what I would do. Uh, in terms of the uh, the boxes, if you can clear them out now, you know I know it's mid February, but birds are starting to look. I can assure you. Um, so yes, uh, let's have a look. Yeah, Tracy said about tigers on the reserve. Yeah, quite incredible that, isn't it? Imagine saying your <laughs> land's got tigers on it. Um, oh yeah, yeah, three percent Debbie. That is a shame for India. Uh, but then I guess, you know, there's not a huge percentage of the UK. I'm not sure on the number, but, um, yeah, it's not a big number. I know that. Um, yeah, so Tracy, hopefully you'll be able to see from the photos there that uh, Krishna's land did uh, has regenerated very well. And over the last 15 years, a lot of native trees and shrubs indigenous to that part of India have come back. So it's fantastic. Um, Cackleberry Gardens, we have enormous deer... 
have an enormous deer overpopulation. There is a good bit of wood here, or wood here. We are on a wooded acreage, but the deer have decimated the underbrush, destroying all the habitat for wildlife here. Yeah, so deer can be a problem. I think I've touched on this before. Um, you know, because of course they will eat anything up to well, you know, reasonably thick shoots. Uh, so of course any um, trees and shrubs that are looking to establish themselves on the ground are going to be um you know decimated by i mean in the uk we've got munjai deer roe deer uh, fallow deer red deer so you tend to find you get a bit of a monoculture if you're not careful where you know the branches of a tree start just out of reach of the deer and there isn't much vegetation below that so of course your ground nesting birds or your warblers that are going to enjoy things like bramble thickets and all that sort of stuff obviously their habitat is uh, stripped down so uh, yeah it can be a bit of a problem on that one uh, no real easy solution on that, apart from re releasing some wolves, maybe. <laughs> Let's not go down that route now. Um, Grey Cat Blue said, so good to know there are people like Christian in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why I wanted him on, because he's such an inspirational guy. Um, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so... Um, oh, hello there. It's Steve Voller from Instagram. Stephen. Yeah, hi, Stephen. Um, got in touch recently, so... Nice to see you, if you're still around. Sorry, I'm just trying to catch up on the messages before we call it a day. Um, cool frogs, absolutely. Um, yeah, so just scrolling down now. One second, I think I'm catching up. Um, Spencer said, get in there, Joel, and do a documentary. You could be the new Attenborough. Right, easy with the uh, same as that, Spencer. <laughs> There's a big boots to fill. <laughs> yeah, but I'd be absolutely delighted. I, I have got plans to go out to India. There's a few people that have asked me to go out there to film some of the wildlife. So uh, I will hopefully be bringing that to you guys when COVID permits and all that. But, um, yeah, can't wait to get to India. It looks like an incredible place. Anyone that's been, do let me know there experiences um spencer also said saw a speckled wood drinking directly from the pond last summer never seen that before yes yeah, speckled wood butterflies um yeah they will and uh, as with a lot of butterflies they will uh, they will drink uh, from puddles uh, from time to time for the water uh, absolutely they will um stevens again um Donna said, if I had money, I'd want to create sanctuaries too. Absolutely, Donna. Uh, Donna, by the way, on um, on Twitter has been doing some great posts recently of her field fairs and uh, various different birds going to her numerous feeders. Hats off to you, Donna, for your um, feeding stations. They are quite incredible. <laughs> they are uh, absolutely a wash. Well, of course, do remember as well with your feeding stations to clean them out on a regular basis. A lot of disease and pathogens can be... Uh, spread through uh, bird feeders of course so do clean them out on a regular basis and the food that drops on the floor as well uh, the goldfinches in the garden here are particularly messy and drop probably 50 percent of what they pick out the feeder uh, so do try and keep on top of that if you can um, yeah so everybody's saying thank you to krishna keep up the great work which is yeah i couldn't agree more with um yeah Absolutely amazing, inspirational, Chris, Krishna. Yeah, I think you've wowed the world, Krishna, by the looks of it. Spencer said you'll be needing two hours soon, Joel. Yeah, not lo not wrong, Spencer. <laughs> um, yeah, so everyone's saying thank you to Krishna. It's fantastic. Um, so... Runner Bean has said, I've got the liner ready to make a pond, but where's the best place to source the pebbles to edge and make a pebble beach? Uh, I would suggest just your local garden centres. Most of them will stock like the 25 kilo or 20 kilo bags these days of pebbles or gravel or anything like that, just to allow access, as I'm sure if you've been reading my book um, or um, you know watching some of the YouTube videos, you'll, you'll see the importance of access for wildlife in and out of a pond. Uh, so I would um, yeah, just try the local garden centres. Uh, obviously, if they're open, uh, most of them will stock some aggregate that will tick the uh, box, no problem at all. 
Um, Clive Laughing Man, bat boxes too, Joel. Yeah, I've not mentioned bats. I feel a bit guilty now. Um, yeah, bat boxes, if you can. They they have a 15 mil uh, cavity. I could have brought one in to show you, actually. 15 mil cavity for things like your common pipistrelle bats. Uh, and um, high up on a house, if you can, three to four metres. South or west facing. So uh, what I would say, bird boxes, uh, while I'm on it. Um, north or east facing. Uh, please, please, please don't put any bird boxes south or west facing because they can get too hot and the chicks can um, cook and die, unfortunately, uh, with the heat if they are maybe a second or a third generation, perhaps, um, you know, in a box. So um, bird boxes north and east facing, coolest side of a house, obviously, or a tree um, or fences, that sort of thing. Away from the reach of cats, if you can, of course, deep in cover. Uh, but I'll be doing a whole video series on all the different bird boxes. There's too much to go through now. But as I say, BTO website is the best place you can check for them. But bat boxes, Clive, absolutely valid point. Bat boxes, complete polar opposite. They like to be warm during the day, so south or west facing and three to four metres high. And if you want to make some bat boxes, please check out Bat Conservation's website, um, and they will have equally a fantastic resource for lots of information on there as to how you can build the Kent. The Kent bat box is what I would say is probably the best bat box you can build. If you're going to build one yourself, just again, some six inch um, timbers will be absolutely fine for that. Uh, but yeah, any problems, just get in touch with me and obviously I'll point in the right direction. Uh, good point there, Clive. And um, yeah, uh, Stephen Voller, when's the best time to build a pond? Uh, well, Anytime, Stephen, really. I'm building them 12 months of the year. So, um, yeah, sooner you get it in, the sooner the wildlife turns up. That's the answer to that one, I think. Um, so, Krishna's come back. You can, Phoebe. Krishna's still around, by the way. He's answering the chat if you've got any more questions for him for the next couple of minutes before we uh, before we wrap things up. Uh, he said, you can, amphibians, I don't want to disturb natural equilibrium as those who feed on those tadpoles will be deprived of food. Oh, yeah, so that's going back. Yeah, if you scroll back up the chat um, for, for that convo. Um, Donna said, being queued to a range of pebbles and large cobbles, £18 for three bags, I think I paid, but uh, wash first, very dusty and pond went white. <laughs> Cleared after a few days, but comes back after rainfall and disturbs it all. Yeah, so again, any aggregates, wash them first if you can, um, before you put them in a pond, of course. Um, yeah, so good advice there from Donna if you're in the UK, being q do some other garden centres are available, of course. <laughs> um, so Keith has said, the Wildwood Trust in Kent are going to introduce a couple of bison to Bleamwoods to manage them naturally, which uh, will help the butterfly conservation there. Wow, be interested to see that, some proper bison in Kent. That'll be uh, quite a sight, wouldn't it, Keith? Nearly forgot, guys. Um, butterfly of the week, uh, before I try and wrap things up um i would like to talk for a moment just about the butterfly that you ought to be thinking about uh, which you possibly might see towards the end of february uh, in the northern hemisphere uh, particularly the uk and europe and that is the peacock butterfly which have these fabulous eye patches um on the wings which are uh, to replicate the eyes of an owl because these butterflies do overwinter as adults in the uk and in Europe, so they'll be in log sacks, they'll be in barns, outbuildings. So remember, if you've got any uh, peacocks or any butterflies that are overwintering at the moment, so things like red admiral, small tortoiseshell, um, and peacock, then do leave windows, doors slightly open if you can on any sheds or outbuildings, so they can get out when the weather starts warming up. Usually March time, but sometimes you get one or two at the end of February uh, in the UK. But obviously on the continent. Grey cat blue, you might see some uh, in Brittany a bit before us, of course. Um, but peacocks, yes, so the best way you can attract them to your garden is by providing the larval host plant, which is the uh, nettle, the common nettle. So don't get rid of all your nettles. And, of course, it's the, the food plant for a lot of other venessid species, red admirals, commas, uh, and small tortoiseshells. So leave some nettles in the garden, particularly in a sunny spot. Uh, and also provide some nectar for them. So things such as buddleias, of course, are a great one. They're out when they're flying. Um, teasels as well, they, they do enjoy. And, um, of course, things like the um, hempagrimony are another good one. Uh, but the early emerging ones obviously need, they're all the summer species, of course, when the, the main brood um, are um, emerging, if you like, in, uh, in sort of June time. 
uh, end of June. Uh, but of course, the, the overwintering adults will need a nectar source as soon as they come out in February and March time. Um, so good things that you can um, plant in your garden for them are things like blackthorn. They will nectar on that. That's a very early flowering shrub. Blackthorn is, and I've done a video on that on the channel. Um, and also things such as marsh marigold. If you're planting a pond at the moment, do put some marsh marigold in. Uh, I've got a great photo, which I, I, I would show you if I uh, knew where it was, um, of, a, of a peacock on some marsh marigold on the edge of my wildlife pond in the back garden here. Uh, so that's another really good source for them. But uh, if you're not sure, then get in touch and I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you a few more points on those. But yes, peacocks would provide the nectar plants if you can, along along with the uh, the larval host plants, which of course are the nettles, as I say. And then if you can, leave a shed door or window slightly ajar in the autumn time and you may find, or end of, end of August really, they'll start going, or in, even early August, they'll start going to roost and then they'll stay in that... Um, uh, you know, sort of state for uh, most of the autumn and the winter until the spring again uh, and overwinter as that adult butterfly. So keep an eye out for peacocks in log stacks. Try not to disturb log stacks outside or in barns, for example, during the winter months because you may disturb them. And um, yeah, they are a wonderful, wonderful butterfly. Uh, so David Attenborough's favourite butterfly, uh, the peacock. So uh, yeah, a nice way to start our uh, live uh, discussion on butterflies around the world so i will try and feature a different species each um each session of course uh so um yeah do uh, do stay tuned for that one but the peacock is the butterfly of choice today so hopefully that gives you a few pointers as to how you can attract them to your own garden and encourage this uh, fairly widespread butterfly so yeah good job i thought i remember that i nearly nearly forgot to mention it crikey um let's just have one last flick down uh, Kieran says hi Joel any nice tips on how to attract hedgehogs to your garden well uh, access for one of course but it uh, is by you know creating some holes in the fences for them and that sort of thing gates etc but they're going to they're gonna need the food which of course is mostly going to be worms and insects and um, slugs and snails as well so providing uh, you know dense vegetation for uh, these other animals to live to provide a natural food source for them so that would be probably the best way I would say on that one Kieran um, Spencer said, here they are close to reintroducing beavers back to the UK would be great if we could get the links back too well yeah you never know there's hope yeah be quite uh, quite interesting to see links although I dare say it might be a bit too controversial for for some members of the public um, yeah re-release mail saying about the beaver yeah doing well in a lot of areas the beaver actually is up in Yorkshire I was speaking to a good friend of mine Andy who uh, uh, you may have seen the adder video on the channel um, who actually monitors, the, they've got beavers up there on the North Yorkshire Moors which are creating some wonderful habitats so yeah, really doing well, beavers are such fantastic uh, habitat creators shall we say, nature's habitat creators 90% um, native saying there's a great documentary on beavers using a keystone species in the US on Amazon Prime, right, oh yeah, I might check that out um, yeah, I'll have a look at that Um, well, Tracy has said, um, and Krishna is keeping his reserve purely for wildlife and research, and how can it be protected for the future? Well, hopefully by sending private ownership, Tracy, is the main thing. Um, and then at least he can monitor it and pass it on to um, his kids when he's gone, of course, so they can look after it. Um, and I think... We are about there. Keith has said, I look forward to more butterfly chat. So nice to have someone who shares my enthusiasm and I still have much to learn. So do I, Keith. Uh, and you have promised me a Donis Blue this year, so I will hold you to that if, of course, COVID permits. <laughs> uh, no, looking forward to it. No, butterflies are my absolute passion, along with all of the forms of wildlife, of course. Uh, but, um, yeah, I am a, a big, uh, big ambassador for butterflies and the promotion of creating habitats for them and conserving these wonderful indicators of the environment. Of course, wherever you see butterflies, they are a very good indicator of a good environment and a, and a healthy ecosystem and habitat. So I think that about wraps us up for today, guys. Thank you so much for joining me again. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, and wonderful to see the uh, the story of how Krishna has um, 
maintained a small parcel of land in uh, in India to uh, to make sure it absolutely stays as a haven for wildlife for many 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 years to come so thank you very much um, obviously if you've got any questions then do drop them in the comments below if I haven't answered any if I've missed any then I apologize I will do my best to catch up with it all uh, and I will be uploading this to YouTube uh, soon after the show of course so that anybody who has missed this or joined late you can see the whole thing live uh, well not live but uh, you can watch it again of course on YouTube and um, stay tuned keep me posted if you know anybody following on from Krishna's amazing story if you know anybody out there who is uh, a wildlife conservation hero who's someone who's selflessly providing habitats for wildlife whether that is just in their own back garden or a public space then do get in touch let me know uh, I'm sure you would all love to see some of the stories a bit like Krishna's around the world of people who are doing their utmost to protect and conserve wildlife so if you know of anybody then do recommend it to me recommend them to me um, if you want to get in touch you can get me on the email which is wildyourgarden at gmail.com uh, that's wildyourgarden at gmail.com and uh, drop me a line on there and of course I can I can follow that up no problem at all and uh, and stay tuned for uh, I'm going to be uploading a video uh, shortly hopefully maybe later on tonight um, but uh, I have I have promised the other half uh, a nice meal and uh, a few hours out from social media so uh, looking forward to that but um, yeah do do keep in touch via the usual channels Twitter Instagram YouTube of course and uh, keep sharing this with everyone. Hopefully, we will continue to build a fantastic community of wildlife gardeners and conservation enthusiasts around the world and help promote as many habitats as well for wildlife as possible. So, join me in two weeks again, and uh, I'm absolutely 100% going to just check the date so I don't get it wrong. So, two weeks' time, we are going to be the end of February, 28th, Sunday the 28th of February, Get it in your diaries, 3 p.m. GMT, same time. And, of course, I'll prompt you with a video nearer the time. And, um, yeah, it'll be good to see you all again when, hopefully, we might be a little closer to spring and there'll be a few more plants out. And, uh, yes, thank you very much to you all for the support. It's been absolutely incredible. And uh, do... Uh, do keep following the channel. There's lots more inspirational videos to come. I've got lots more content to upload in the next couple of weeks. Stay tuned. Thank you so much. Keep wild in your own gardens and green spaces and spreading the word. And I'll see you all soon. Thanks, guys.